Hello and welcome back to Global Value. In today's video, we're performing a fundamental stock analysis of NetApp Inc, ticker symbol NTAP, NTAP. We're looking at NetApp today as a subscriber request, so shout out to Mitchell for recommending the business. Currently, NetApp is trading for $66.34 per share. Over the last year, their stock price is down 28%. Over five years, NetApp is compounding at a rate of 3.5% annually. Over 10 years, the business is compounding at a rate of 6.5% annually. And going back prior to the global financial crisis, NetApp is compounding its stock price at about 4% annually. Keep in mind that the company does pay out dividends, so their average dividend yield throughout this nearly two decade long period would be in addition to this compounded annual return. Currently, NetApp pays out about a 3% dividend yield, which is well above that of the yield of an S&P 500 ETF. Right now, NetApp is trading about $8 above their 52-week low. The business is down just under $30 from their 52-week high. About 2.5% of the company's shares outstanding are currently sold short, and NetApp has about a $14 billion market cap. So for more background about the business, NetApp is a leading provider of enterprise data management and storage solutions. The company's three operating business units are products, software maintenance, and hardware maintenance. NetApp transitioned from a data center storage firm to a company with software data management solutions for multi-cloud environments. The San Jose, California headquartered company sells globally and has approximately 10,000 employees. NetApp Inc. was incorporated in 1992 and serves a diverse group of customers across a wide variety of industries through both a direct sales force and an ecosystem of business partners. So for our fundamental analysis today, we are performing the Select 6 analysis, taking a checklist style approach of six standard financial metrics to come to a holistic and beginning understanding of NetApp based off of their business fundamentals. So this analysis is still a work in progress and it's an opportunity to learn in public, so it will continue to improve and get better over time. With that said, let's get right into today's analysis. Starting things off with metric number one, we want their average return on capital over the last five years to be above 14%. And there are two major reasons for this. The first is that over the long run, over the course of decades, a stock is likely to return approximately what its underlying business returns. And these business returns are going to be captured here by return on capital. The second is that the average publicly listed business earns about a 7% return on capital. So by looking for a benchmark of 14% or higher, we can potentially build in some margin of safety for ourselves based off the overall quality of the business being about twice as good as average. So NetApp earns significantly above average returns on capital. They've done so in all five of their previous fiscal years. While their returns on capital have bounced around somewhat, their lowest returns came in 2018 at just about 22% returns on capital, and their highest came in 2020 at over 45% returns on capital. Averaged out over this time frame, NetApp is earning about 33.5% returns on capital, which is more than double that benchmark we're looking for. So this is a massive check here to start things off on metric number one. NetApp earns returns on capital that are about four and a half times better than that of a typical business. And over their last 12 months, the company has earned about 31% returns on capital. Next up for metric number two, here we're taking a high level overview of the growth of their business. So we're looking for revenue, net income, and free cash flow growth over the last five years. This metric is all or nothing in nature. Either all three of these are going to be up for this to be a check, or if even one of these is down, this entire metric will be an X. We'll also be including their last 12 months worth of numbers in our calculations here. So over this time, NetApp has modestly grown their revenues, with their revenues being up about 10% over the past five years. Their net incomes are up over this period, although the business did have an income tax expense in 2018 that significantly lowered their net incomes in that year. However, they'd still be up over this period. Over this time frame, however, the business has seen their cash flows decline. When we look at their cash flow statement, we can see that the business had a nearly $800 million charge to their other operating activities. This significantly lowered their cash from operations, and they've also upticked their capital expenditures by nearly $100 million off of a base of $145 million in 2018. While their extra spending on CapEx might not be that bad, you'd most likely want to do the work to understand what this charge was for their other operating activities, as that had a significant impact on the business's cash from operations. Because of that, again, their free cash flows are down over this period, so this means that this is an X on metric number two. This may be potentially concerning because free cash flow is really the lifeblood of any business, and ultimately a business's abilities to produce free cash flows now and until judgment day 
Discounted back by some reasonable interest rate is what that business is going to be worth. So a business can use its free cash flows to reinvest back in the business, make acquisitions, buy back shares, pay down debt, or pay dividends. Again, it's not great to see that their free cash flows are down here. Next up for metric number three, here we're taking the perspective of an individual shareholder in the business by looking at NetApp on a per share basis. So we're looking for earnings per share growth over the last five years. We learned in our previous metric that their earnings are up over this time frame. However, we still want to look at what the company has done in terms of their shares outstanding. NetApp really shines here because over the last five years, the company has bought back 18% of their shares outstanding. So they bought back nearly a fifth of their business. So this is likely a major benefit for long-term shareholders in the business because when you purchase a share of stock, what you're really buying is a fractional ownership percentage in that underlying company. And so when a business buys back stock by decreasing the number of shares that they have outstanding, they're increasing your ownership percentage in the business without you having to spend a dime. This means that they're increasing the percentage of the business's profits that you're entitled to, and it's almost as if the company is making a partial acquisition of itself. So just like with any other acquisition, we want the company to be getting more value than the price that they're paying. So in practical terms, this means that we want the company buying back shares when it's trading for below its intrinsic value, and it looks like an attractive use of their capital relative to some of their other business opportunities. Between these pretty massive share buybacks and stronger net incomes over this time frame, this is strong earnings per share growth here for NetApp. Over their last 12 months, the company has earned $6.54 for each share that they've had outstanding, meaning that this is a check here on metric number three. Metric number four, we're looking for something very similar. So here we're looking for free cash flow per share growth over the last five years. Unfortunately, even with the company's very strong share buybacks, again, as we learned, their free cash flows are lower over this time frame, and their free cash flow declines have actually outpaced their share buybacks, meaning that the company's free cash flows per share are going to be down over this period and that this is going to be an X on metric number four. Over their last 12 months, the company has earned about $4.04 .04 of free cash flow for each share that they've had outstanding. And so to recap where we stand currently, through our first four metrics, we're split evenly, two checks and two Xs here for NetApp. Next up for metric number five, here we're evaluating how the business is utilizing debt. So we don't want to be investing in overly levered businesses because during economic downturns, it's overly levered businesses that are going to be at the greatest risk of poor outcomes. So we want their net debt, which is their total debt minus their cash and their short-term investments, to be below the amount of free cash flow that the business has produced over the last five years. So NetApp has actually had negative net debt in all five of these years, meaning that they've had a significant cash position on their balance sheet and they have quite a bit of cash cushion. Recently though, this has come down somewhat. So currently the business has more than a $300 million negative net debt position. So after paying off all of their debt, the company is left over with $300 million. In addition to this, the company has been massively cash flow generative over the last five years, and the business has produced $5.6 billion worth of free cash flow, meaning that this is a very strong check here on metric number five, as again, the company has quite a bit of cash cushion on their balance sheet, and they're very strongly cash flow generative. Again, because that charge on their cash flow statement, over their last 12 months, the business has only produced $900 million worth of free cash flow, so that's down from where they have been at over these last five years. However, that's still pretty massively cash flow generative, even relative to the size of their business, meaning that this is a very strong check here on metric number five, meaning once again that this is a very strong check here on metric number five. Then our sixth and final metric, the big metric of them all, we want their average free cash flow to their total enterprise value to give us a yield that's above 5%. If this is the case, this will potentially give us a slight risk premium to the yield of the 10-year treasury and potentially offer us a reasonable starting point for evaluation of net app. So we're using their total enterprise value because it takes into account both their market cap and their net debt position, and it's going to give us a perspective of the business that's more similar to as if NetApp were a private company. So currently, NetApp has about a $14 billion total enterprise value, and we learned that over the last five years, the business has produced $5.6 billion worth of free cash flow, meaning that in an average year, the company is producing about $1.1 billion worth of free cash flow. So when we divide their $1.1 billion of their average free cash flow by their $13.9 billion total enterprise value, about a 7.9% average free cash flow to enterprise value yield for the business. So that's more than double the yield of the 10-year treasury currently, and that's several percentage points above that 5% risk premium that we're ideally seeking. So this is a check here on metric number six. 
As relative to their historical abilities to produce free cash flows, it does look like the business may be potentially offering an attractive risk premium relative to the 10-year treasury. Additionally, to get a current free cash flow to enterprise value yield for the company, the business has produced $900 million of free cash flow over their last 12 months. So when we divide their $900 million of their last 12 months of free cash flow by their $14 billion total enterprise value, that gives us about a 6.5% current free cash flow to enterprise value yield for the business. So both on a current and an average basis, it does look like NetApp would be potentially attractive here. However, just because this is the case doesn't mean that you're going to run out and go buy the business. This just means that NetApp may be potentially interesting to dig into and learn more about and that the business could be potentially attractively valued today. Keep in mind that this type of analysis is not financial advice and that this is just one of our six metrics here. While these metrics are simple, when they're combined together, they can be very powerful and they're meant to be taken in holistically. Plus, we've still got some interesting aspects of the business left to cover. Then as a bonus, here we're taking a look at NetApp's dividend profile. So currently NetApp is paying out a 3% dividend yield, which again is better than that of the yield of an S&P 500 ETF currently. However, people make mistakes all the time by blindly chasing dividends, so it's important to stop and look at the underlying fundamentals of a business to see whether those are healthy and to determine whether the company is able to healthily and easily support their dividends with their free cash flows. In the case of NetApp, because of their type of business, NetApp has grown their dividends pretty healthily over the last five years. And in all five of these years, it looks like NetApp has easily been able to support their dividends using just their free cash flows, and they've never paid out above a 50% dividend payout ratio. So their dividends seem to be well supported by their free cash flows. This likely means that their dividend could be healthy and sustainable going forward into the future. This is a snapshot of the past five years of their performance. So even though this is no guarantee for the future, their dividend profile does look like it's in potentially pretty good shape here. Everything we've discussed so far is important, but there's something missing that in my opinion is the main reason to analyze NetApp, which takes us on to using a discounted cash flow model to come to a potential fair intrinsic value for NetApp. So a discounted cash flow model is just like any other model in any other discipline. Its outputs are going to be dependent on its inputs. So here we're starting with an average of their free cash flows over their last three years and using historical growth assumptions for how their business has grown their free cash flows over the last 10 years to project these out into the future to give us a baseline for the company going forward. So it's up to you to do your own homework here to determine whether or not these historical growth assumptions are gonna be accurate and applicable going forward for NetApp to give us that baseline projected estimate for the company into the future. But if we assume that they can grow their average free cash flows at a rate of about 6% annually, which is how they've grown them over their last 10 years, and this growth would be for the next 10 years out into the future. Then we assume a terminal stage for the business where this growth rate declines to about 4% annually. We're not going to be adding in the company's tangible book value, which would give us a perspective of the business's tangible net worth per share, because that's going to be skewed very significantly based off of how the accounting is done for the company's massive share buybacks. So the company, again, does have a negative net debt position. So the business does have tangible book value. It's just skewed by their accounting. So this likely is going to throw off our model here as well. But if we're seeking a 15% rate of return from the business, which is the rate of return that Warren Buffett is ideally looking for from his investments, then it looks like at today's valuations, a potential fair value for NetApp is right around $41 per share. So this looks like there would not be a margin of safety in the business compared to today's stock price, with the business looking like it's more overly valued than even fairly valued. Again, please keep in mind that caveat about the accounting that's done for their tangible book value, and also be mindful that this 15% rate of return would be including their dividend yield, so 3% of this would be coming from their dividend yield paid to shareholders, as we would not be doubly counting their dividends here. A discounted cash flow model is really based off of how predictable a business's future free cash flows are likely to be. NetApp looks like its free cash flows have some level of predictability. However, there are still some other types of businesses that likely have even more predictable future free cash flows. So that's just something to keep in mind as well. Then please remember that this type of analysis is not financial advice. It's not a buy or sell recommendation of any security. And before considering any potential investment decision, please consult with the properly licensed and registered legal and financial professionals. So in just a minute, we'll talk about our summary for NetApp, but we have to address something first. What are some of the qualitative aspects about this business, especially those that support the key points for either a potential long or a potential short thesis of the company? Then starting with some of the key points around a potential long thesis for NetApp, 
Number one, leading public and private cloud vendor partnerships could shelter NetApp from declining on-premise spending. Furthermore, the company may benefit alongside cloud-based workload growth. Number two, NetApp's all Flash Array products are installed in mission-critical places within a network. As all Flash Arrays proliferate, NetApp may become stickier with enterprises. And number three, in line with NetApp's focus, cloud-based data management software may be one of the most important IT resources. NetApp could develop into a crucial element of the multi-cloud ecosystem. System. Then for some of the key points around a potential short thesis of the business, number one, there may not be a substantial storage refresh cycle after all flash technology adoption. In this scenario, fierce competition for software contracts could weigh on NetApp's performance. Number two, NetApp competes in highly competitive markets against much larger players. All flash arrays may only provide temporary growth and white box solutions could be preferred over NetApp's hardware. And number three, enterprises migrating to public clouds may not require NetApp software. Hyperscale cloud providers could promote their generic offerings over NetApp products. So hopefully that offers a potentially balanced perspective around some of the key qualitative aspects of the business. Now it's time for our recap. So in summary, NetApp checks the box on four out of our six metrics. The company is earning significantly above average returns on capital of about 33.5% on average. While their revenues and net incomes are up over the last five years, their free cash flows are down due to a change in their other operating activities. So this was a $800 million charge over their last 12 months that you'd likely want to dig in and learn more about if you're potentially interested in the business. Even still, over the last five years, the company has bought back 18% of their shares outstanding, and the company is sitting on a cash cushion of more than $300 million dollars while being massively cash flow generative over this time frame. Additionally, on both a current and an average basis of their free cash flow to their enterprise value, when we compared that to the yield of the 10-year treasury, that looked like NetApp would be potentially offering us a slight risk premium to the yield of the 10-year treasury, and that this business could be potentially interesting to dig into and learn more about. When we looked at the company's dividend profile, it looked like NetApp was easily able to support a healthy and growing dividend over their last five years, and the company has maintained a dividend payout ratio of under 50% in all five of these years. Finally, performing a discounted cash flow analysis of NetApp, if you've done the work and you believe that those historical growth assumptions are going to be accurate and applicable going forward for the business, and if you are ideally seeking a 15% rate of return from the company, then it looked like NetApp was trending toward being more potentially overvalued at today's price of the company based off their current valuations. Again, though, remember that the accounting is skewed because of their share buybacks, and the company does have tangible net worth. So in order to come to a better understanding of the business and have more realistic and appropriate inputs for a DCF model, you would just want to dig in and learn more about the company to understand those more appropriate inputs for the model. So it's worth reiterating that this type of analysis is not financial advice, it's not a buy or sell recommendation of any security, and before considering any potential investment decision, please consult with your financial advisor. This analysis instead serves as a beginning and holistic understanding to help you determine whether it's worth your time and energy to dig in and learn more about NetApp. One resource that will definitely help you stay up to speed with what's going on in the market and help you learn more about the business is Seeking Alpha. Checking out Seeking Alpha directly supports the channel as I'm part of their affiliate program. So most of you probably know Seeking Alpha as a source of community written articles on different stocks. But over the past little while, they've actually become a lot more than that with their new offering, which is Seeking Alpha Premium. Premium has a number of different features where you can track buy, hold, and sell ratings on your favorite stocks. These ratings are from the Seeking Alpha community, Wall Street analysts, and Seeking Alpha's algorithm. You can see earnings call transcripts, investor presentations, SEC filings, and press releases all in one place. You can add your own margin of safety targets and get alerts for when your favorite stocks hit that level. You can get unlimited access to Seeking Alpha articles, and you can take your reading experience based on the type of investor you are. You can get 10 years of financial data on any stock to help you with your analysis. You can also import your portfolio into your Seeking Alpha dashboard to make researching easier. And if that didn't convince you, the best thing is that an annual plan is only 119 bucks. That's just 33 cents per day through my referral link down in the description below. Normally premium is $239, but if you use my link, it's 50% off. So check it out if you're interested. So through this deeper research, you'll learn more about the qualitative and the quantitative aspects of NetApp, and you'll likely be able to determine for yourself what a reasonably appropriate intrinsic value for NetApp will be. As a value investor, you want to research a business as if you're going to own 100% of it, and you can truly understand the ins and outs of that company and learn about the business accurately, completely, and then go back and ask yourself, what did you miss? In order to learn the underlying essence of that business and understand what's going to matter for the company going forward and what's not going to matter. 
So with that said, that's it for today's fundamental stock analysis of NetApp Inc., ticker symbol NTAP. Again, thank you to Mitchell for recommending the business. I'm happy to make an analysis of the company. So if you enjoyed today's video, please be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel for more stock analysis videos, and comment down below what business you want me to take a look at next time. Thanks for learning about NetApp with me, and have a great day.